Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My sobriety date is January 19th, 1994. By the grace of good sponsorship, a loving God, 12 step. Uh, I still have my first white chip. That doesn't mean that I'm special. That doesn't mean that somebody walking in and out of this room 25 times, 50 times, 90 times to get this program won't get it. It means that I've got a window of opportunity that so far hasn't closed on me. It can close when I leave here tonight, and I know that. So I don't ever think I have this, because I know I don't. We're going to be talking about steps. We're going to be talking about my experience through the steps. Uh, first thing I like to get is the formalities out of the way. I don't speak for Alcoholics Anonymous. No one has that right or that authority. I just have my experience. Uh, I'm going to start off with a little, a couple of little sayings, one from the 12 and 12. And I'm going to use both pieces of literature. I came in that way. Some people believe, you know, you know only as, as, as outlined in the big book. Other people say, I got everything through the 12 and 12. Well, I got everything through both and a lot of other material. So... You're going to get all my material, because I got it. You guys got to listen to me. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, my experience is, it's the, the uh, 12 and 12, it says, uh, right at the very beginning, uh, AA's 12 steps are a group of prayer principles, spiritual in their nature, which have practiced the way of life, can accept, expel the obsession to drink, and make the sufferer usefully and happily whole. What's a principle? I had a principle when I was out on the street. My principle for living on the street, which for mine was mine, and what yours was want to be mine. Uh, <laughs> kind of, to say a nice word with a gun and just a nice word alone. Those are the principles I live by. I live dirty. I acted dirty. And that's how I lived my life. I didn't even know what a principle was when I got in here. There's negative principles and there's positive principles. Uh, so uh, there's another part in the book, and I'm starting with principles for a reason, because uh, I don't do things according to just those 12 that you see up on the walls in a lot of rooms. It says, uh, in 1953, I'll go back a little bit, give a little history, there was a speaker in California who spoke, and he said, these are the principles behind the steps. Somebody liked it, they wrote it down, and they passed that card around, and since 1953, people say the principles behind the steps. Well, our literature tells us that the principle is the step. There are a lot of things that come out of the first step. Uh, so... When we talk about principles, there are positive ones, there are negative ones. Uh, I lived by a lot of negative ones, and I didn't know what positive principles looked like. Uh, in the first step, there are 27. I know that because my sponsor had me go on a journey in the 12 and 12 and find them all. Told me not to look at it for the next five years, and then when I go back, I can find what I missed. So I'm sure there is some that I missed. Uh, a big book, before we get into the first step, states of necessity, of necessity, there will be discussion of matters that are medical, psychiatric, social, and religious. We are sure that these matters are from their very nature controversial. Nothing would please us so much as to write a book which would hold no con uh, contention or basis uh, for argument. So if there's something I say here that you don't agree with, please let it go. Don't come to me, ask me, and tell me why sponsor didn't tell me that, so it ain't going to work. Whatever works for you works. If the one word principles behind the steps works for you, by all means use it. I just have my experience. My experience is I use them when somebody's confused. How do we get to honesty? Well, we get to honesty a lot of different ways. One is through surrender, another is through admittance. So that first step, and those are two principles that are in the first step, uh, defeat, um, sufficiency, humility, purpose, willpower, desperate action, tolerance, God, patience. Powerlessness, will, strength, confidence, truth, unmanageability, <laughs> confession, meditation, sacrifice, honesty, open-mindedness, prayer, restitution, control, hopelessness, conviction, happiness, acceptance, and admittance. Those are all discussed on four pages in the 12 and 12. It's amazing that we don't see what we need to see until it's time for us to see it. And we don't hear what we need to hear. I walked into a room of Alcoholics Anonymous on January 19th of 1994. There's a big guy by the name of Bob Welsh. He was a man who carried a message to me. And uh, he said to me, listen, 
I walk in the room and I would say, I have a desire not to drink. And I would talk about a lot of other substances and how I did them and how I wanted you to throw me out of here. And I go into a different fellowship and do the complete opposite. Uh, and there's a reason for that. I didn't know the reason at the time. The reason was I wanted you to throw me out so I can go get loaded. Loaded to me, I'm not going to get hung up. I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to talk about alcoholism, not alcoholism. I'm going to talk about how I learned that the substance in, that I put in my body does not matter. It says in the big book, alcohol in any form. So I don't get hung up whether it's a pill or if it's a this or a that or it's in powder form or liquid form or some kind of form I haven't seen yet. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I've heard many different things I've never done and there's a lot of things I did you guys will never hear of. And that's a real good thing to know that once we walk in here, we're all equal. Nobody drank harder than I did. Nobody drank less than I did. Nobody drank more than I did. Uh, there's a part in the book that says from park place to park bench. Zero is zero. Whether you had two drinks and walked in here and said, hey, my life is unmanageable. We'll get to what unmanageability is for me in a minute. Uh, and, and stopped drinking. Or you did like I did. Folded a cardboard box on January the 18th and went into a detox. That's how I came in here. We came in here different ways. Zero up here. Or zero down here is zero. We're all equal. So I try, whatever I say, I will ask everybody if they can, if you can identify with it, the feeling, the emotion, the situation, please use it if it helps you. If you can't, don't take it personally because I have a bad habit of telling people exactly how I feel. <laughs> um, did that from the day I walked in. Uh, in our big book, one of the first things it talks about, in the doctor's opinion, it says, it did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, we were in full flight from reality, uh, we were outright mental defectors. Right in the doctor's opinion. I look at it a lot differently. When I read that, I said, oh, that doesn't apply to me. That may be you. That ain't me. So when I walked in here, I thought I was okay, and you guys were all screwed up. Little did I know that I was the one who was screwed up, and you guys were really okay. It took a long time for me to make that transition. Uh, today I know that I look at that, those three things, that war perception, perception, faulty judgment, and lack of awareness. That's what I walk in here with. So if that's the things I make my decisions based on, I'm in trouble before I start. If I'm not seeing things as they really are, then I'm seeing things as I'd like them to be. You know, I was talking to somebody today, I am now 62 years old, I can hardly walk up a flight of steel, stairs, in my mind. I am 21 years old, and I can run a 10-second 100. <laughs> Ain't going to happen no more, but my truth may not be the truth. And I had to learn the difference between my truth and the truth. So it says that men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Yet they admit it is injurious after time. They can't differentiate their true life from their alcohol life. life. Uh... It's the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontent. I live my life restless, irritable, and discontent. That was normal for me. Alcohol was my solution. When I was in any one of those feelings, a drink made me feel not bigger than, not better than. It made me feel normal. And that's what alcohol did for me. It made me feel normal. It didn't give me more courage. You know, I hear people, and that may be true for other people. This is my experience. That's all I have. Uh, you know, and I got into these rooms and I didn't want to be an alcoholic. See, I knew I was in a lot of trouble because the cops were throwing me against the wall and frisking me because I was like 90 pounds uh, when I got here, 110 when I got out of detox treatment. Uh, I was as skinny as a rail. I was doing a lot of other substances besides alcohol and I thought I looked great. <laughs> the walk mind of the alcoholic. You know, there, there it is, right there. And, uh, you know, Cops were picking me up before I even got off out of the subway, and the way I got out of the subway, I was just telling somebody this story today. Uh, I used to joke about uh, being a drunk, being, a, being, a, being an, an alcoholic, a drunk. To me, a drunk lived on the Bowery near the Brooklyn Bridge. I was an uptown guy. I lived under 59th Street Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> just the way I saw it. And my walk perception had me convinced that I wasn't like that. I was exactly like that. But I couldn't see it. Uh, so I didn't believe I was an alcoholic. I believed I had a legal problem. I had a state of New York problem. I had an ex-wife problem. I had a children problem. I had a job problem. I had every problem in the world. 
but alcohol was never my problem. It was always my solution. If I go back to when I was a child, though, uh, my first drink happened when I was uh, seven years old. My first drunk that I remember was when I was seven years old. My grandfather died. And in the religion I was raised in and was born into, not the one I practice today, get to that in later steps, uh, they used to have little shot glasses, or they, we call them shot glasses, little paper cups, a little bit of whiskey in them. And I went around and I drank them while everybody was mourning my grandfather's death. And I got drunk. I liked it so much, and I lived in the living room of my uh, mother's house, and I would open up the liquor cabinet, when they were asleep, and I take a little bit out every night, and I replaced it with water. Well, we had a woman that came in and cleaned for us. She got fired for stealing the alcohol. I never told the truth. So I was a liar before I crossed that invisible line that they talk about. I was already stealing and cheating before I knew how bad things were going to get. Had I known then, I don't know if I would have continued, but knowing me, I probably would have. Uh, the big book goes and talks about, starting on page 20, and I jump, like I said, to both books. On page 20, it talks about uh, the different types of alcoholics. Almost dead. Uh, it talks about the um, first type was the moderate drinker. The, is the hard drinker. Then there's the uh, third type. He's the guy who's uh, has, uh, been puzzling you, especially for his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible tragic things while drinking. That was me. I always did absurd. Tra and I thought it was fun. <laughs> See, I didn't realize that was insane. And that, that's a big word for me is insanity. I'm not one of those that agree with the definition of the word insanity as I hear it in the room. Insanity, me, is not doing the same thing over and over expecting a different result. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, knowing the result I'm going to get and then doing it anyway. Because I drank for the same reason every time to get loaded. To not to feel whatever it was I was feeling, good, bad, happy, sad, any of those things that I went through, I drank to get drunk because I liked the effect that alcohol produced. Um, then there's the, uh, those are the three types of alcoholics. Then we go a little further on, and then there are four types of alcoholics on page 108 through 110 in the big book. And then there comes the two questions. All right, there's two questions that it's asking. Are we agnostics? And it's one of my favorite two questions because I was around a while because all of these types of alcohol does not give me a definition of what an alcoholic is. I've been all those types at different points in my drinking career, but I still don't have a definition of an alcoholic. It's not, how would I say it, it's, it's not concrete enough for me yet. And I'm sitting in these rooms, I'm miserable, I'm doing the work they're asking me to do, and I just don't understand what it means to be powerless or unmanageable. I think, you know, you guys are nuts. You guys are laughing. You're happy. Uh, I don't understand what you're talking about. You're talking in a language I don't understand. Uh, and here were the two questions somebody asked me. They said, when you honestly wanted to, you find you couldn't con uh, quit entirely, or when drinking you had little control of the amount you took, you're probably an alcoholic. Well, I said to the guy, well, you know, that's possibly true. He said, listen, George, you want help? I'll help you. He says, but I'm going to tell you. If you're looking at Bill's story, and you've read that far, because when I asked the guy, and when I came in here, his name was Bob Walsh, carried the message to me, he said to me, listen, I need you to come in here early in the morning, early before the meeting, set up the tables, and save that seat for me, and you sit over there. So I came five minutes early, and then he told me, then I want you to stand by the door, and I want you to say hello to everybody coming in, and welcome to the 10 o'clock meeting. And after I did that for a while, then they got to get another five minutes earlier and start making coffee. And at the end of the meeting, it was folded the chairs and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So I got kind of tricked into this thing uh, through service. I don't know about anybody else, but that's how I came in. And he said to me, alcohol was your friend. It stopped being a luxury. And that's right out of the big book. It stopped being my friend. It turned on me at some point. I don't know when. And I couldn't see that it did. I lived on the street and didn't see anything wrong in any of my behavior. That's the Sam. Big book uh, describes insanity as the inability of the proportion to think straight, page 37. And it's very important that I remember that, because my insanity is my lack of ability to see things clearly. That's all it means. So I was insane for a very long time, because I didn't see things clearly for a very long time, even in sobriety. Uh, it says, liquor ceased to be a luxury. 
gradually things got worse. Uh, man, I'll tell you, my life was great. I ran a union, I had a family, everything was going wonderful. Uh, one day I come home, the ex-wife doesn't want me there anymore, I have a daughter that was born ill, I have a, uh, a son that's uh, um, getting a little older, he doesn't want to know from me, I got a job that's taking all my time, I forget something from work one day and I come home and I find my wife and my best friend. That was my bottom. That was 1987. And I will tell you, from 1987 to 1993 of December, I did everything I swore I'd never do. Because I was given some morals. And alcohol was fun. Now it was fun and trouble. Now it became trouble. That was my bottom. My bottom was nothing but trouble. And that trouble led me to places to do things to change every bit of my moral fiber that I never had, that I had never thought I'd ever give up. All the things my mom taught me. Uh, I didn't speak to my mother for five years before I got here. I had a sister that died while I was in active alcoholism. I had another sister that I didn't talk to me for my first two years of recovery. That is stuff that I own today, because I did that. I have children that didn't talk to me for years. That is stuff I own today. That's a direct result of my alcoholism. That's nobody else's fault but what I do for me, not what they did to me. It was real hard for me to see that, and there's that warped perception. That sharp mind of the alcoholic, it's their fault. You know? uh, it sure wasn't. Bill's story talks about the very bottom of my bottom. My, li my very bottom was uh, December of uh, 93 when I knew I had to get off the streets in New York because I was getting bounced around by the cops too much. People were chasing me. A lot of them had names with vowels. So I was trying to duck them a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't doing nice things. And I, you know, I was living by a very immoral standards. And it talks about, in Bill's story, no words can tell the loneliness and despair I found in the bitter remorse of self-pity. I sat there. I sat in that cardboard box on Christmas 1993 with a bottle, a gun, a couple other instruments, and couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't walk. I wanted to enjoy that Christmas so badly that I had to go to a Woolworth and steal battery-operated lights cut a hole in this cardboard box, lit it up. Now, I walked all the way to 49th Street and Broadway, walked back to 59th Street to get back under the bridge, and, and, and had my Christmas there. I couldn't walk to Rockefeller Center to see the Christmas tree because I wasn't worthy. The loneliness of self-pity that I fall for me. I decided I was going to get some help, so... Being an ex-union official, which I lost because of my drinking, I never would admit that for many years. I thought it was because the guy who was next to me didn't like me. I don't know how many people lost a job that way, but that's how I lost my job. Uh, I called a person I started an employee system program with five years earlier. And what ended up happening is uh, she said, I told her about this guy I knew. He was doing this, and he was doing that, and he was doing psychedelics, and he was drinking, and he had a problem. She says, bring him in tomorrow. Let's, I think we can help him. So I go marching into this office, and I knock on the door and see this employee assistant program person, and she says to me, uh, George, where's the guy you were going to bring to me? I said, he's right here. You know, big joke. Uh, she says, you're kidding. Now, I helped write a program while I was getting loaded every day. Uh, that's what I did. I drank at 10 o'clock in the morning. I did other substances. I put a program together for members in my union. 34 of them went into recovery. Because of the program I put together, but I didn't need it. The delusionary thinking of the alcohol, the shock mind, I like to say, the alcohol, that what perception that I lived in. Ended up happening is we sat and we talked and I was given some choices. I was always given choices. I didn't always take the right one, but at this time, things started changing. Don't know why they changed. I don't know how they changed. I just know they changed. The first choice I was given was to uh, <clears throat> either stay in New York, and then go up uh, to go to Connecticut, or I could go right upstate New York. One was to a hospital, and then to Connecticut, to a treatment center, or another one was to just go straight upstate New York to a treatment center, and I'm thinking of all the people that I'd done damage to, and all the things that I did, so I decided it would be better if I got out of town. So when people say geographicals don't work, that's not my uh, experience. I went upstate New York, and I'm still sober. So geographicals work. If you work at it. It comes back to how willing are you to go to any length. 
I got up to that treatment center and they told me I was going for 28 days. So I doped in one of my old bosses for a couple hundred dollars. I turned around and I uh, went out and did as much as I could. I got on a bus and uh, almost got arrested by the police. That's a story by itself. With my insanity of what I was doing. And I ended up uh, getting to this treatment center and they said, there is no detox for you. You have five days and you have to be out of here. I had a resentment to the treatment center. Anybody who's been in a treatment center, I'm sure you can relate to that. Uh, and uh, they weren't doing things my way. Isn't that amazing how that works? And what ended up happening was um, on the fourth day of that seven-day stay or five-day stay I was having, that union that I hated and wanted to get even with, and the guy who uh, helped me lose my job, who I wanted to kill, and an ex-wife who wouldn't let me talk to my kids, uh, my counsel comes to me and says, your mother had a massive heart attack and she wants to talk to you. She hasn't heard from you in five years. Before she goes, she wants to talk to you. The big book talks about a jumping off place. No loneliness in the sphere that you do. It's in a vision for you. I was at a jumping off place at that point. That's not my only jumping off place in sobriety, believe me. It's not my only surrender in sobriety. Uh, I went to my sponsor and I went to my, I went to my counselor and I said, uh, Tim, I said, listen, I can't call my mother because if she's not going to die, uh, tomorrow, uh, if I call her, she's going to die. So she, we, we made a plan to call that employee assistant program person. And I kind of did an intervention on myself without knowing what an intervention was. It's another word I didn't know. Uh, they weren't around back then, uh, as those words. And uh, I ended up uh, calling this uh, this um, counselor, and uh, we talked. We called my mother. And I don't know if it went after that what happened. I, it was my first little miracle, I like to say. My first awakening. I went to my counselor and I asked him for another chance. I said, I'll do whatever it took. See, I was playing the game already. I was in there for a couple of days. I knew I wasn't going to stay. I was already planning my run. So you guys that don't think relapse happens before you pick up, trust me, it happens long before you pick up. And then that run, I knew where I was going. I knew what I was going to get and I knew what I was going to do. What ended up happening was that... Uh, I went to that counselor and I asked for another chance. That five-day stay ended up being another week and another week and another week and one more week. I graduated the... Graduated, I like that word. I graduated uh, the treatment center at 28 days and didn't get, get to leave till 32 days because I had no money to get anywhere. And it's a long walk from upstate New York. They gave me an option. It's my second option. You can either go to Florida or you can go to Arizona. I said, great, I like Arizona. <laughs> See where I sit. Now, why would I pick Arizona over Florida? It's real simple. My family lives down here. I don't know about you, I break out in spots, New York, California, <laughs> Chicago, not in handcuffs. And anything that's going to bring me any kind of discomfort, I run from. And uh, California is the other side of this country, far enough away that I don't have to deal with it. So that's the way I lived my life for a long time. They said, no, you're coming down here. And I got here, and I have a 38-bus ride, 38-hour bus ride from L.I. Dog about to meeting in itself. And when I got down here, I get off the bus on a Friday night in the middle of Pompano, and I look around, and all that's there is a cop. Now, if you know me, I don't go with the cops. If you know what I look like, it was 38 hours without sleep. Three people on that bus were taken off for using on the bus different substances. Uh, I lost my luggage. I didn't know where I was going. I sure as hell don't remember where I'd been. Uh, I'm lost. And I go over to the cop and he says, I don't know where I got to take you. And he throws me in the back of a cop car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to jail. I'm already shot my to the outlaws. I'm going back to jail. I mean, I mean, I'm under investigation in the state of New York. They put out a warrant. I'm going to jail for 25 years now. I know it's happening. It's all coming down tonight. Yeah. The way my mind was working. I was, I'm out of treatment, not even uh, three days, and here I am. Throwing me in the back of the uh, thing, they dropped me off at this halfway house. Now the halfway house won't take me in because I'm coming out of the back of a police car and they think I'm a wet drunk. So I have to beg to get into a halfway house, which I do, and I was hungry. So they took me across the street, and across the street was a pizzeria. It's not there anymore. I mean, the pizzeria is still there, but they don't have on the wall, the triangular box with all the bottles of wine. 
that I had to sit there and look at. I couldn't eat because I wanted to drink. I was thirsty. I was very thirsty. But I didn't drink that day because I had two guys in the halfway house that watched me. And uh, the next day I had to go to a meeting, and I was too proud to ask for help. I don't know about anybody else in here, but my pride was killing me. And I walked to this meeting, and I met Bob, the guy that I met at my first meeting, who carried the message to me. And I became his pet project. I always <laughs> joke about it. And uh, I walked home. And I did that my first couple of months of recovery, uh, because I was too afraid to let anybody know how unmanageable I still was. I couldn't get a job here, because I was a union official in New York, and I was an organizer. This is the state of Florida. They don't like union people down here, let me tell you. I had to sign a waiver to work at Denny's for $1.97 or $2.11 an hour that I wouldn't try and organize the workers. Can you imagine that? $2, you think for $2.11, I, I was making $34 an hour. Don't they know who I am? That's <laughs> where I started my uh, career in recovery, is uh, busing tables. And uh, I did what I was told to do. Uh, the book talks about the old pleasures were gone. They were but memories. We could not recapture the great moments of the past. In my mind, that was the greatest thing since white bread. I don't know anybody else. Did. But I, I, I could do nothing wrong. I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. How did I end up here in this situation? I never once got to see the truth. My truth was much different than what was really going on. See, I lost a job because of my behavior. I, got, I opened up Ellis Island. I was the audiovisual tech up there. Uh, they asked me to leave the island because one day when I was not in the office, when I opened, threw up switches, they found a bag with some residue in it, so they please asked me to leave with, with two police escorts coming onto it on a federal island. You bring on a illegal drug. Where's your thinking in that, you know? That's where my drug and alcohol use took me. Uh, that's how sick my mind was. And I foresaw nothing wrong with it. It made perfect sense. What safer place to do than to get loaded than in an island? You said, that's the way I thought. Uh, never we could recapture the great memories of the past. There was the insistent yearning to enjoy life as we once did and the heartbreaking obsession that some new miracle of control would enable us to do it. Uh, I had to let go of control. First step to me is all about surrender. How do I let go? I don't know how to let go. I don't know about anybody else. I didn't even know I had a problem. How are you to let go of something you don't see? How do you let go of a feeling you don't realize is going on? How do you do a first step? You know, that was, you know, I wrote one in the treatment center. Don't ask me what I wrote. I still have it. It still doesn't make sense. They told me to write it, otherwise I can get out of this. So I wrote it. You know, uh, um, <laughs> we admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had come on a See, I can understand the unmanageable part of that step, because my life was... You live under a bridge. You don't bathe. You don't. You wash your clothes in toilet bowls in movie theaters. Uh, you know, you sleep in the street. You go between East 42nd and West 42nd Street to stay warm in December. I consider that a little bit unmanageable. <clears throat> the sad part of that, which had to be brought to my attention by a loving man, he said, Joy, you were making $2,200 a week. Where did the money go? I said, well, it wouldn't go to rent because it made no sense because then I couldn't do what I was doing. That was the logic, and that really made sense to me. You couldn't convince me that spending $1,600 a month for rent in New York was worth it because that meant I had to give up a week and a half's work of work so I could live. I was living fine. And that was the way, the way I looked at it. Uh, the part in the back of the big book, a vision for you where it talks about the hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. I lived in that. No different than irritable, restless, and discontent. And that's why I stayed in that bubble, especially when I got here, that I wasn't healthy. My sponsor said, George, you're talking wet again, you're talking like you want to drink again. I did. I sat in these rooms and wanted to drink. How do you let go of what you don't know how to let go of? How do you turn around a thought process that has been with you your whole life? How do you get rid of a war perception? How do you change faulty judgment? So I was trying to think my way out of this, and it was driving me 
crazy. I would get up at 10 o'clock in the morning and go to a, a step meeting. They would read something like the ninth step, and I'd go get on the phone. I had like a whole three weeks, and I'd hear somebody talk about making amends, so I call a friend that I stole $5,000 from. And say, hey, I'm calling to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Guess what? They forgave me. I said, oh, I like this. So I called somebody else that I owe $10 to. I still don't talk to that guy 18 years later. So I don't know what that plan is, but how do you do these things? You don't do them alone. That's how you do them. And that was the hardest thing, is find somebody I trusted enough with all my stuff to help me. So who likes to admit complete defeat? None of us. At least if you're like I am, you don't. Uh, practically no one. Every natural instinct cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. See, I knew the unmanageable. Well, powerless over what? People, places, things? Uh, no, I wasn't powerless over that. I used to say this, you know, if you would hurt my feelings, you didn't exist anymore. I treated you like you were dead. You just did not get through. The wall went up and you were not allowed in. And I lived my life that way. Very lonely place to be. Um, as time went on, and uh, I had to come to believe that I had an illness. And I had to get to page 62. Now, I was told to read the big book. Uh, read the first 164 pages, and uh, Dr. Bob's Nightmare, that's how I was taught. And I read, uh, you know, how much can I read? Oh, 20 pages a day. How about doing five? You know? uh, so I read five pages a day, and I got through the part. It took me about 30 some odd days. And I started doing the actual step work with a no different guy than Bob. Bob carried a message of hope to me. Larry S. is the guy who literally took me through the steps. I picked him because my halfway house said you have uh, till Saturday to get a sponsor or you're out of here because it was my two weeks were up. And I didn't have a sponsor. So he was from Del Rey and he was speaking in Broward County, so I asked him to sponsor me. If you're anything like I am, that was a perfect sponsor. He lived there, you live here. Perfect. Never see him. Little did I know every Tuesday he'd come and pick me up and we'd sit in Denny's and we'd go through that big book. We'd go through that 12 and 12. And slowly but surely I started doing the work that was laid out. Uh, I write on all my steps, you know, the big book, uh, the 12 and 12 talks about the first two steps are based on reflection. Well, my sponsor had me writing, so I wrote. He asked me to write where I was unmanageable as a child, teenager, and adult. He asked me to write uh, where I was powerless as a child, teenager, and adult. He didn't ask for a life story, so I wrote it. Uh, and it was pretty easy because uh, I remember when I was five years old and uh, I was uh, I was raised uh, Jewish and uh, my uh, my, my mom had a little Christmas tree, and they hid all the presents in the closet, and I would pretend that I was sleeping, and when everybody went to bed, I opened everybody's presents. I got to uh, spend that next day standing behind the curtain. I don't know about anybody else how they were punished, but that's how I was punished. I remember being punished standing behind the curtain for something else I did, getting a little 10-cent knife out of one of these uh, penny machines and cutting the vinyl uh, shower curtain to see how sharp the knife was. So I was standing behind the counter, and we lived on the first floor. I was standing behind the curtain in the living room. That's how I got punished. And I snuck out the window to go play with my friends. Boy, did I get a whale that. I don't know about you. I got a couple of beatings. Some of them I deserved, some of them I didn't. But uh, if I really look at it, uh, I probably deserved more than I did. Uh, so my process with that was I started reflecting back on my childhood. One of the things I reflected back on, and uh, it took me a lot of years in recovery to discuss it, took me therapy after that. Uh, I have no problem talking about it today. I was seven years old, right after my grandfather died. Uh, I was, we, as kids, and when you were us, little, us that are a little older, we used to help the older people with their packages. We thought to do that. And I helped these two women home with some packages, and they weren't women, they were men dressed as women. And I was molested at seven years old. That was what kept me dirty. That made me look at life very different. I didn't never think. That was my secret. Because no one was ever going to hear that. No one. And I was going to take that to the grave with me. Uh, it took me a long time to discuss that in rooms, I'll box and honest. But it needs to be said. Because I'm sure I'm not the only man that was raped. And I'm sure that a lot of women can identify with that. And we'll talk more about that when I get to a different step. But that is my experience. So I didn't tell anybody. Couldn't tell my father because of the way his belief system was. My mother couldn't know. My sisters wouldn't know. And that kept me feeling dirty and apart from for many, many years. Um, I had to come to the understanding that I had an illness, and it centered in my mind. I had a, you know, the, you know, the alcoholic obsession 
when we get to uh, page 30 in the big book, it talks about an illness is his thought, and we've come to believe it in an illness. Way before that, on page 17, I'm going to tell you how I actually got to my first step. I got to that page 62 in the big book, where it says, selfishness, self-centeredness, we think is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find out we've made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles we think of our own making, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will when riot, although we usually don't think so. I didn't think so. That fit me, and I even thought that was pretty cool. So my sponsor had me read that every day until I understood what it really meant. Uh, that was my assignment. And uh, as I, things started to click a little bit, I started to remember, and certain groups read it more about alcoholism in some meetings. They don't do it up in this area, but down in Broward they do. And uh, in it they talk about, on page 30, the certain words that just stuck out, stuck out at me. Uh, obsession, illusion, insanity. Delusion, incomprehensible, demoralization. Those words just sound nice, but if I really look at them, that's me. I was uh, had a, an obsession to drink, drug, and do other substances. Uh, I was illusionary. I thought I was bigger and better than everything that was really going on. I was definitely delusionary because I didn't think anything was wrong with me. You guys just didn't understand. Uh, one of my favorite stories about the uh, first step is when I talk about. Uh, uh, walking into the room and seeing a pair of praying hands. I'll tell that story in a minute. Um, and the demoralization. I was demoralized when I got here, and I didn't even know it. Uh, one of my favorite stories is, uh, I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and there was a big pair of praying hands in there. And I said to the guy, Bob, at the time, I said, I know you guys are going to have me selling flowers on a corner. <laughs> this is a Christian program. He said, no, this is a spiritual program. He says, uh, I said, yeah, but I see that. That's... Somebody on their hands and knees praying. He says, do you know the story of the praying hands? No. So why don't you go find out? Great sponsorship. Uh, so I had to go digging. I brought it. I'm not going to read it. I think I brought it. Uh, and there is a story of the praying hands. And the praying hands are about two artists, German artists. One of them once said, I'm going to go to school and while you work. And when I get finished with school, then I'm going to work and you're going to go to school. Well, the first guy went to work while the other guy went to school. The guy went to school, became an accomplished artist. He, came, he finished his schooling. He went to his friends, and he said, all right, it's your turn to go to school, and his friend picked up his hands, and they were crippled. He said, I can't. A hard labor won't let me go to school and practice the craft of art. And his friend felt terrible, and he walked by his room one day, and he saw him nailing and praying. So he made a sculpture of those guys, that guy's hands. See, it has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with a, a gift that he wanted to give his friend. So it's one of those stories that when you find out what's going on, the big book says your imagination will be tired. Life will mean something at last. Uh, I needed somebody to fight my imagination because I was way out there in my own walk perception. And, and that's what Bob did for me. So I learned the story of the praying hands real early on, and I started to open my mind a little bit. That's why I said if you can relate to something, please use it. Uh, we have a couple of places in the big book. When I went to Bob, I said, Bob, will you work with me? And he said, yeah. He said, well, let me give it to you the way I got it. So what does that mean? He says, well, on page 142, <coughs> into the employers, believe it or not, of all places to hide. It's not the only place it's hidden, by the way. The big book is hidden in a lot of things. Bill is very smart. We're going to get back to the illness in a minute. Because I still hadn't come to grips with that first step. On page 142, Bill, uh, there it is. Uh, it says, uh, Be assured that we do not intend to lecture, moralize, or condemn. If that was done formally, it's because of misunderstanding. If possible, exp express the lack of hard feelings towards the individual. At this point, it might be well to explain alcoholism, the illness. You say you believe he's a gravely ill person with this qualification being perhaps fatally ill. Does he want to get well, you ask? Because uh, many alcoholics being walked and drugged do not want to quit. Does he? Will he take every necessary step 
submit to do anything, to get well, to quit drinking forever. The hardest thing I ever had to wrap my head on in Alcoholics Anonymous was a 24-hour concept. I ran a union. I was thinking what I was doing a year from now. I had my plans already made. I had my outcomes already made. I was in projection, and I was allowed to because I was a projectionist in New York. I got the license to prove it. I ran movies, and I showed them, so I was a projection. So when I came in AA, and you guys were talking about projection, I wanted to know what everybody, how knew everybody knew what I did for a living. That's just how warped my perceptions. Uh, I went to Bob. Bob asked me the question. Are you willing to go to any lengths? I said yes. He says, you're full of junk. I cleaned that up. Uh, and uh, I'll work with you anyway. The big book on page 142, 116, page 90, it says, for good, for all, forever. That was the question I was asked. And I said, yes. He says, you can't do this forever. You can make a commitment to do it forever, but you get to work at it one day at a time. So that's where that one day at a time concept started to come into play for me. I started to understand that I get 24 hours to work on my sobriety. And I was told real early on, anything I put before my sobriety, I'm going to lose. How did I get to that first step? I still didn't tell you how I surrendered. But all, that, all this information, I still haven't told you how I got there. Well, I read page 62, I got to page 30 and heard about the obsession. And then I went, and I went back, because there was a speaker, uh, it was a year and a half sober. I'm sober a year and a half, did my steps, did all the work, still not happy in my recovery. Uh, There's a guy by the name of uh, Hollywood Henderson, who was telling his story at a men's meeting, and I went over to him after the meeting, because he said he knew he's one of those alcoholics who was the warp life to blame his children, where his mother took a shotgun and ended his father in this. I was taught real early on when somebody says they heard it in the book or it comes out of the book, go ask them where it was. So I went over and I said, uh, can you show me where that is in the book? He said, sure. And uh, come to me after the meeting and I come up to him and he opens up his big book and he shows it to me. For a half hour I started to argue with him. It wasn't in my big book. <laughs> Shot mind to my alcoholic. I had a different big book. Uh, I, he said, well, why don't you go home? Here's my phone number in Texas. I'm leaving. Call me tomorrow night. I went home, I opened up my big book. Not only did I have it highlighted, I had it underlined. <laughs> so that shows you we don't always see what it's time necessary for us to see until it's the right time. And because of that little statement, a little further on in the big book, because Bill is very smart. On page 82, he talks about the alcoholic. Uh, is like a tornado running through the lives of others. Sweet relationships are broken, the home is in turmoil. Uh, Said wives and parents, anyone can increase on the list. The same thing, the orbit of the alcohol. The damage we do when we're out there, or that I did when I was out there, was, I always thought, would never get straightened out. I'd like to say that everything came back to me after my second year of recovery. That's not my story. My story as we go along and these steps unfold, you will see all the, the different things that I had to go through, health issues, and family issues, and children issues, and ex-wife issues. State of New York issues, and you know what? Through it all, and especially the health issues, a drink was not going to make any of it any better. See, that's when I knew I took my first step, when I conceded to my innermost self that I was really an alcoholic, that all the rest of the step were excuses. See, I would tell my sponsor at six months when I walked out of an AA meeting, and I was served with papers to give my children up. The reason I came an alcoholic, anonymous, the real reason was to duck the, the trouble I was in in New York, and get my kids back in my life, and deal with my ex-wife, and the marriage that she married the guy that I caught her with eight years earlier. That's why I came in. At six months, I walked out of an AA meeting, I was served with papers to give up those children, and I flipped out. Threw a chair at somebody, threw over a bookcase. Uh, my sp uh, sponsor said to me, I would straighten it up, because he was bigger than I was, a lot. He was like 6'2 by 6'2, I wasn't arguing with him, so I straightened it up. And he asked me to go to speak to a guy by the name of Ben Titty, a couple of years ago. And uh, I sat down with Ben, and he said, let me ask you one question. I said, what's that, uh, Ben? He said, what kind of custodian were you? Well, I gave him the house, I gave him this, I did that. I said, I didn't ask what you did for him. Well, I'm sending him $380 a week. Or I said, I didn't ask what you did for him. What kind of custodian were you? And I woke up six months into sobriety, my second job in place, that I knew that I was an absentee. Emotionally absentee, father. And I had to sit for a year and fight with whether I should sign those children over legally or keep them. When we get to step nine, we'll talk about that. Because I signed them over. 
I had to do what was best for the children, not what was best for George. For the first time in my life, I didn't think about me, I thought about somebody else. So the first step is about me giving up me to something I don't understand. And the first person I gave that up to was not God. It was my sponsor. She had a whole lot of God problems. We'll be talking about that as we go along. But the the uh, the principle that I will find no enduring peace until he first admits and accepts. In the 12 and 12, it doesn't just say we admit it. We have to accept it. And when I accepted in my innermost self that I couldn't drink safe, I knew I did it first step. And I didn't know I did my first step until I did my third step. I just kept doing the work that my sponsor laid out before. Um, talks about It's a statistical fact that alcohol is never recovered on their own resources. Self cannot fix self. You hear it all the time. A sick mind can't cure a sick mind. I needed the help of others. One of the greatest gifts in the first step is the first word, we. It's not about me anymore, it's about us. And once I had an us in my life, another man that I trusted, a group that I trusted, my life started to change, started to get better. Uh, since step one requires an omission that allows to become a manager, how do we, how do other people make this step? It tells us that we try and raise the bottom for the younger people. You don't have to live under a bridge to get the first step. You don't even have to lose a job. Uh, you know, I always heard my sponsor tell me the story. There's a guy who has a filthy mouth, which was me when I got in here. And there's a woman that walks in and, uh, I used to talk about dope and everything else because that's what I did. I didn't know any better. I had no respect for the room. How can I have respect for the room? I had no respect for myself. And he said, there's a woman in this room that was in this room today, and she went out and died because of you. I said, what are you talking about? He said, this woman never did a drug in her life. You're in here talking about pills and heroin and this and that and how you did that, and she does not relate. So she went home and just drank herself to death. You better learn about respect for this room. I had to let go of my old ideas, absolutely. And we read it and how it works all the time. And if it wasn't for the guidance of a loving man that told me how to behave like a human being, the purpose of the book is to find a power that's going to solve your problem. Uh, I had a lot of problems when I got here. My biggest problem was about, I believe, my own shit. That was my biggest problem. And I couldn't convince you anymore. So when I started letting go of that stuff, I started opening up a little bit more. I became more able to hear what was necessary. Uh, the first step is all about giving up. They told me the steps are real simple. You give up, you show up, you give up, you grow up. I wasn't, sh I was showing up, but I wasn't giving up. As I started to give up, and it starts in step one giving up, I was able to be more open to listen to what other people had to say. Whether I took their advice at the beginning, we'll talk about that next week. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.